Hi, welcome to the Mom Mentality Show. My name is Austin Chadwick and my co-host is Chris Lucian. And today we have Heidi Helfand on the show uh, to talk about some awesome topics, including uh, dynamic reteaming, sustainable pace, and probabilistic forecasting. Uh, so to get us started, Heidi, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for having me here, Austin and Chris. I'm Heidi Helfand, and I live and work in Southern California, uh, just a little bit north of Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, I've been in the software industry for probably about 20 years, working at different startups, working at highly changing companies, and wrote a book about that called Dynamic Reteaming. I currently work in a company, wonderful company called Procore Technologies, where we, <laughs> yeah, at Procore, we're trying to change the lives of everyone in construction by connecting everyone to a global platform. So I uh, do lots of interesting things at Procore across our research and development group. And uh, maybe we'll get into some of that content. It has to do with helping teams better answer the question, when will it be done? Which is a, a question that is uh, critical to answer for, for many of us, and we need a good strategy for it. And I learned some really valuable techniques from Mr. Daniel Vicanti. And uh, yeah, so really happy to be here. Fantastic. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we should get into dynamic reteaming. Uh, I know that you and I have talked a lot about it in the past. Um, I think a lot of our viewers may need an introduction to the concept. So uh, who better to talk about it than the author of the book? So. Yeah, sure. I'd love to give an introduction. And yeah, Chris, thanks again for being one of the people that I interviewed for Dynamic Reteaming. Um, you know, uh, many of us uh, who work in software development uh, might have heard the traditional wisdom that says, you know, for teams, the, the best teams or the most effective teams are the ones that maintain the same structure, that stay the same. And in my years of experience, I've noticed that, hey, wait a minute, this is more of a moving target than, you know, this stable entity that gets to know each other, forming, storming, norming, performing in order to create the amazing products that we build. And so at one point, uh, just hearing that emphasis and that wisdom kind of spurred me into action to try to prove the point that, hey, wait a minute, I think it's more effective if we're going for uh, productive, highly effective teams. I think it's more effective to focus our energies on the fact that they change more than focusing on trying to keep them stable or the same. So I found that folks, that focus on stability where, you know, maybe, maybe some people want that and I respect that. Um, but a lot of the times having an emphasis on that can be counterproductive to the needs of the company, especially if, let's say you're a company with an in intent to uh, double or triple in size, maybe build a large company. Uh, you really got to lean into helping the company morph and change as opposed to trying to fight all the changes. And so, yeah, so then I thought, well, this interest in, uh, changing teams or the changeability of teams? Was it just me and my experience? Or is it something that's an industry thing? So then I started to interview colleagues around the world and you know, Chris being one of them and uh, some of his, his and our shared colleagues. And I found just the richness of a lot of different stories about how team change kind of plays out in dynamic companies. Mm -hmm. Um, and then dynamic, you know, so there's a changing nature of teams. Sometimes it might feel like there's a lot of change on many different levels. Like one person might move from this team to that team, or it could be that a team grows big and it splits in half, or it could be that a company acquires another company and all the people are blended. There's like different levels to re the reteaming concept. And so dynamic reteaming is really when there's, there are changes in teams and things are happening at different levels, it, the feeling can be that, huh, this, you know, lots going on here. <laughs> this is quite a dynamic situation. And so, so dynamic reteaming as a concept kind of came about. And the book talks about, well, what does this look like? What are the patterns of dynamic reteaming? And let's say, if you're going to catalyze it, how can you do that? Or... And I think in, in a lot of cases, sometimes 
teams. The changes to our teams happen outside of our control. So how are we gonna cope with that, deal with that, and really prepare for that? So yeah, I go into some kind of uh, different discussions about, you know, it's gonna be inevitable that your teams are gonna change. This is a natural occurrence. So you might as well kind of lean into that and get better at it. And so there's techniques in the book. Nice, and so it's, it's not about, uh, you know, if I re reiterate a little bit, it's not about, uh, you know, trying to optimize one team to the nth degree, but acknowledging that change is a fact of life and that at any point, any one of those team members could leave. And so being good at change, uh, you know, much like agile versus the waterfall mentality, being good at change with, with teams uh, can, can really be a benefit to an organization uh, that experiences a lot of that. Yeah, and, uh, and it's, yeah. yeah, and how can we reduce, since we know this is gonna happen, maybe one of your best colleagues decides for life reasons, maybe uh, his or her spouse got a job in another state and remote work isn't happening or something. Like, yeah. I guess it is now, but yeah. <laughs> like somebody has a life change that takes them out of the team. Like, how's your team gonna deal with that when it happens? Because it will. So practices like pairing, mob programming kind of help to provide some safety that the information might continue on, mm. or, or maybe you'll have an easier time getting over that change later if you employ some of those practices, for example. So you, uh, you had interviewed many different companies. Uh, maybe what are, what are some examples of people doing dynamic reteaming well? Um, and, and, you know, it, it, or, and, and maybe poorly too, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, what does that look like? Uh, yeah. yeah, so, so I'll say in general that, um, and in the, in near the end of the book, there's a, a chapter about retrospectives and feedback loops and surveys. I think the idea is, so you're going to catalyze a change, right? Let's say it's a deliberate change, not just somebody moving away and it surprises you. Um, so there's kind of some, let's say you have a reteaming initiative, some kind of deliberate thing. I think really leaning into kind of before, during, and after, reflecting on how it went, gauging the sentiment of the people and how they're feeling during and after this kind of thing is important. So I think like reteaming well involves talking about what happened and aiming to kind of get better at it. So kind of putting reteaming as a concept under continuous improvement. I think it's also helpful, and I see different companies do this, that, all right, how are we gonna gauge the sentiment of the people and kind of benchmark that sort of health of teams? Some people use survey mechanisms to do that at scale. Mm -hmm. So maybe you have one, you deploy a reteaming initiative, you leverage those tools to gather feedback, how does it impact the metrics that you usually look at in terms of like employee engagement, for example? Mm -hmm. um, so I think reteaming well means not just kind of people in a room changing, changing the people's names on a spreadsheet, rolling it out, and then never talking about it again. <laughs> I think it's really about like, all right, let's like, you're, these are humans. You can't just snap people in line because it's almost like, Oh, it's like a tracer effect or something. It's like, okay, old structure, new structure. But sometimes it takes us a while to get over to that new structure. Sometimes we have transition time that needs to happen and we need to process what happened and like, oh my goodness, I'm on this team now and I have a new manager. It's, it's, it takes a while to, to transition. Um, what, are, what are some things that people can do during those transitions to, to, maybe either stay effective or reduce the damage done by the transition? Yeah, so, you know, I like to tell the story of, I, I, I was transitioned um, to another team once, and it was interesting because it was very, um, it was done by a series of one-on-ones. So it was, it was a group of people and we all reported to one person, mm -hmm. but then we shifted over to a new, we had new leadership come, come in, we had, we shifted over to a new structure and we were in more of a hierarchy. And what happened was those of, we were in this flat structure and we started reporting to our peers. And through like a series of one-on-one -on -one discussions, we all learned about this, but then our original team entity for a while didn't talk about it. And it, so it was almost like a kind of quiet reteaming that happened um, through these one-on-ones. 
And at some point, we were able to have a retrospective together and talk about the impact on our team. Yeah. Because it was, it, you know, it was hard for a lot of people, like suddenly I'm reporting to this person, wait, they're my peer. But I've seen that multiple times in my career. Yeah. Sometimes I've yeah, been yeah. the manager and sometimes others have become the manager. Anything's game in, in a lot of this stuff. That's why yeah. you need to like, you know, really be a good, collaborator with people and, you know, kind of build your brand in your company. But um, I think so talk, like talking together about what happened is important. Talking about what the ending, like acknowledging, I, I, I referenced the work of uh, William Bridges. He wrote a book called Managing Transitions. I'm looking back there because I got the book on my, on my <laughs> table. Managing Transitions. So it's like there's endings and then the neutral zone, mm -hmm. and then the new beginning, right? So the endings is like, okay, well, what are we losing? I wasn't in those Slack channels anymore. That was a loss for me, mm -hmm. right? That community that we had together as those people were goofing around at the beginning of standups, right? Like that was gone for me. It's like, poof, it's gone. I'm like, I'm not in the Slack channels anymore. So that was an ending for me to process. Um, we talk sometimes about, okay, well, if let's say you're on a team and people have left the team, well, what do we want to carry on that that person did beyond their job description mm -hmm. to move everybody forward? We had a, there was a gentleman I worked with that was kind of legendary for when the team hit a victory condition in their delivery plan that they would go to the cliff. We, our office was on this, what, at the side of the Pacific Ocean. They'd go to the cliff and they'd scream off the edge of the cliff. <laughs> right. So this is not in the job description of a product manager to get your team to do that. Yeah. But the team decided, hey, we know he left. We miss him. We're, we're happy for him. He has a new opportunity elsewhere, but we're going to scream off the side of the cliff. And that's going to remind us of him. So I think <laughs> processing the endings, giving people time to transition, knowing that you can't just move us over here and expect us to all mentally, emotionally be over here. Yeah. Some, for some of us, you know, someone said, we, we don't fear change. People don't feel ch fear change. They fear loss. Mm. I can't remember what book that's from. But I think there's a lot of truth to that. It's kind of like hard sometimes to give things up mm. or to not be in that Slack channel and not be with those people. And then after some period of time, we're ready to move on and, and like, all right, it's the new beginning. It's time to start again. And maybe we feel refreshed. So there's a Kubler-Ross, uh, uh, it's like grief, a grief curve. Some people bring in grief uh, tools uh, yeah. when they talk about change. And you know, it depends on the type of, and scale of the change you're talking about, but different people are at the new beginning at different times. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so I think the key is really having the ability to have conversations about the changes in teams so then we have an intuition and kind of know when we can't look back forever, but we need to look back for a while and we need to process what's going on for a while. And then we need to move the hell forward because yeah. we have to change the world. We yeah. got stuff to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so helping coach through change is something yeah. that I like to do. Nice. Yeah, I had a follow-up question. So, in one in one respect, you're you're probably preaching to the choir uh, in many many ways for uh, at least to, at least to Chris um, in in regards to dynamic reteaming because uh, you know he you get to know him for a while. He's passionate about mobs, teams switching up. You know, and the, and I'll admit there's a lot of benefits. You know, what I mean the knowledge sharing happens much quicker when you know you may not may or may not be on the team. The uh, the importance of writing cleaner, more readable code and having, you know, the pipeline doc, kind of document itself, so to speak, and uh, knowing the domain and making sure others know the domain. So there's a lot of benefits to being in that environment where it's like at any moment I may switch. I mean, me personally, in the last two years, I've been on three different teams and I've probably learned more in the last two years than the first 12 years of software engineering. Um, and mm. so there's a lot of benefit to it, but I think there's one part that struggles with me if I'm going to put on the devil's advocate hat a little bit. Yeah, let's hear it. It's just knowing people who really don't want, want it, right? They, like there might be benefits for the company, but they prefer their tribe. They prefer, you know, their home spot, so to speak. Um, there may be people who are, you know, may stay at the same company for 20 years or would prefer to do so. Um, and while they do find change necessary, 
is it really necessary? And does, does, is the needs of the company more important than this person's choice and preferences? I guess that's my struggle. What, what would be your response to that? Yeah, I think um, you're bringing up some very important human questions about team preferences and preferences for change, right? It's, it's kind of like, um, let's say there's, it's like a continuum, right? Not so much change and like a lot of change. So where do you, where do you kind of fit in in terms of your preferences? And how does that kind of cadence match with the company's kind of plan for this? And I think parity in hiring is really important. Like having, like knowing what you're getting into before you join a company is important. And so I think if, if there's a company that does a lot of kind of dynamic switching, pairing, switching pairs, moving people around, like there's a cadence perhaps, or, you know, we know it's kind of more moving than more kind of static or stagnant. I think it's important to have that discussion when you're bringing new people aboard so that you can, um, you know, re reduce the risk all around that you've, you've found a new team member that kind of matches step there. Uh, so I think, there's, I think there's that aspect. I think there's another aspect about just because things might be really movable today, you might not operate that way in five months, depending on the new business conditions. Maybe so many other things are changing. Maybe the the direction of the company. Maybe some some other things are changing so much that it's you want to turn the dial down on the rate of change in the teams. And I think again, you got to power it by retrospectives. I think it's like another point is that it's very valid to not want to change your team and to want to kind of stay here with these people focusing on this topic. And so having those conversations uh, with your manager or with your team, if the team is empowered to determine changes is key. And so having uh, some people like to make, like, here's my career path. This is kind of like my career North star and how I'm gonna move into that direction. It could be that deepening some facet of your technical knowledge is you're able to do that in this team, but not these others, for example. So maybe you want to stay over here. Some people prefer a quarter system in school. Some people prefer a semester system. We, we have these different preferences. So having the conversations with, you know, we rely on managers, you know, have manager training and have like that manager relationship kind of uh, individual contributor and manager relationship is one to kind of nurture and grow to help people find their path. Um, because yeah, I mean, you know, we're different. So like how, you know, how it's like a Venn diagram, like this is what my company needs. This is what I want. We want to find that sweet spot in the middle that uh, is like a two for one. Okay. Um, yeah. So if I were to make it practical, I guess, uh, thinking of uh, people I know who are more of that type is basically just don't let it sit, right? Talk about it, retro on it, um, figure out if there's a way to ease the transition or, um, yeah, yeah. I think, I think you're right, as opposed to just like you said, move people around on a spreadsheet and just be like, ah, there's collateral damage, deal with it. It's the best for the company, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's years old now, the Spotify health check, which mm -hmm. is a facilitated yeah. activity that teams can do to talk about different things. Like what's the definition of awesome? What's the definition of crappy? There's, there's one of their things is, do we feel like we're pawns or players? Right. So like, and, and I think it's, it's really important, right. Am, am I just going to get moved around and not really have any of my input considered? That doesn't feel good necessarily as an employee. I think reteamings that are deliberate, that have a greater chance to succeed are ones that in include people in their design, in their execution and in kind of reflecting on how they went. So if we, if we really want this kind of collaborative culture, I think, uh, you know, we, we need these feedback loops and, you know, and, and recognizing that people have different preferences and goals and, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's, that's and, and that everybody isn't the same you know, we're different. People might choose companies based on the rate of change that they might expect. I mean, larger companies are traditionally, some of the rate of change might be slower. There's a book called Panarchy. I don't have it over there, right? It's in the other room, but there's this book called Panarchy that talks about 
this eco cycle concept that I leverage in my book, which is kind of like, I apply it to teams, like teams age and change. It's kind of natural when teams get kind of, you know, teams can kind of grow bigger and maybe fall into some kind of rigid, rigidity trap or feeling of stagnation. We're so much bigger than we used to be. Things aren't moving as swiftly as before. And people try to come in and reinvent processes to make every the whole machine run more effectively new people get hired and people leave all that kind of stuff we get disrupted and then we kind of move on and i think as individuals we go through these kind of eco cycles as well we might be on a team and it's and you know benefits us to pair and to do other things so that later to hit one of our career goals maybe we want to change teams so we can let somebody else carry the reins on this particular feature set or area of the code base <laughs> All right, so uh, this might be a good time to transition to sustainable pace, kind of looking at the time. Um, so maybe you can introduce us to the uh, um, to your thoughts on sustainable pace. I think that sure be a topic. Yeah, so uh, many years ago, I, I was at a startup called Appfolio, uh, which is a wonderful company that I was at for a number of years, and we were trained by Pivotal Labs with our first team. And so, you know, the engineers on the team, all the team members did pair programming, test-driven development, continuous integration, had these practices. We had two consultants with us for like a year and then they kind of moved off. But we really, I think, uh, embraced the idea that, you know, this, we're not moving as fast as we can and, and getting sloppy with it. We're more like, how can we have a self-testing code base where when we extend it, we get feedback and we know whether we broke or we didn't break our existing tests. And we always took the time to really kind of buttress our code base with new tests of different kinds so that, uh, you know, we could really kind of build a resilient code base that let's say it was a Rails app. We could, we could update Rails and we'd go through these tests, we'd identify things and it, the, the training and, the, and, and what we had gotten really lasted us many, many years at that company. We kind of spread these practices out. Shared code had a, a, a lot of collective code ownership. Um, but with the, one, of the, one of the core values was that we wanted healthy teams that could kind of keep going and did careful work. This is not to say we're trying to like gold plate or or anything uh, what we built, but we really wanted to be able to keep going and to not get burned out and like really focus on health. And it's one concept that's come back to me time and time again in my career, because it's kind of like, all right, well, what does it mean to have a healthy team? What does it mean to have a healthy code base, right, as well, you know, in that unit of people? So how do we, how do we go about that? And, and especially when we get under pressure, right? So I mean, we're paid to create software. We're paid to work together and create this value that our companies are going to sell. There's, there's, I mean, it's, it's a fact, right? So sometimes it feels like a lot of pressure. We have to get these things ready. We have to deliver so we can delight our customers or our internal stakeholders. And in the last kind of 20, in 2019, I and some other colleagues discovered Dan Vacanti's work. He wrote a couple of books, one of them, Actionable Agile Metrics, and one of them, uh, When Will It Be Done? And so many of us have traditionally, when somebody asks us the question, when is it going to be done? We rely on almost by like autopilot, like let's estimate and let's see how long this thing is going to be, how it relative sizing has come into the picture. Maybe we take some story points aligned on what the scale might means. And then, you know, we do our best to try to like give an expectation of when things are going to be done. Anyway, so Dan introduces a, a different philosophy, which is um, looking at uh, your cycle time. So like your cycle time could be from when you start working on something to when you deliver it. And teams can define what that means. And through using charts like a cycle time scatter plot, you can see how your cycle time fluctuates for your team. So it's almost like you, you're instrumenting your team's workflow, you're turning it on, you're agreeing to look at the data, 
And one, one of the things that we emphasize at Procore when we're coaching teams is, okay, we want you to try to have a stable cycle time. So maybe we'll, we'll, take, we'll work with a team. We have a two hour training that we do where we do a simulation so people can understand some of these techniques that we're teaching. It's basic Kanban techniques, but we don't even really use that word. So we want, like, we, we want you to see your cycle time and try to impact it. We want you to try to have it be stable so that you could say things like, ah, 85% of the time, no matter what the ticket is about, it takes us about ah, eight days or less to get a ticket through our workflow. Mm -hmm. So we, we teach teams to see their flow and then we teach them techniques for how to control their workflow. And controlling means we want you to look at this line on a chart and get it to be stable like this, because naturally it's kind of like this, but we want it like this. Mm -hmm. And the, so that we can rely on some of the advanced forecasting that we'll do based on that data. And so the key here is, hey, we're not going for the fastest or lowest cycle time of your tickets. We're not going for that. We're going for stability so that we can rely on the forecasting that we do. And what I've noticed is that just emphasizing this sustainable pace with metrics, and these are metrics for the team, like these are not for the executives to look at, you know, how are they doing? No, that, that's not what this is. These are metrics for the team to kind of see their cycle time, get their cycle time steady, and then they could use it for example, with Monte Carlo simulations to, to predict when a chunk of work is gonna be done. And I really love that message because it's like, a lot of the times when you're going for stability, you're actually lowering your cycle time. It's, it's like you get that too, but it feels better because it's like, um, I don't know, it just, it, just, it just feels better. So that's one way that, that has motivated me to try to connect sustainable pace with forecasting i know yeah. that was that was kind of a lot of words yeah yeah no no that was good um so in the sustainable pace uh i guess how does the probabilistic forecasting affect the sustainable pace is it just because the reduced cycle time over time gives the team a more uh i guess more leeway around their ability to have a stopping point in, in the day? Or is it like, um, I guess, how do they relate uh, for the sustainability, I guess, for the individual when, when uh, dealing with this type of forecasting? Yeah, so I think it's more like, all right, we work in a certain way. And how can we see our work so we can try to improve it, right? See mm -hmm. our workflow so we can try to improve it. And so we use some analytics that are provided it, they're called actionable agile analytics mm -hmm. so that we can see the cycle time and try to make it similar for the different tickets. So maybe we'll work on less items at once as a technique to get a more stable cycle time. Okay. Another technique that we'll do is we'll look at our aging work in progress tickets every day and we'll, we'll talk about the delays in our system and actively move to move our work forward, starting with the oldest tickets each day. So basically looking at aging tickets every day and maybe working on less gets us more through, but it also impacts the stability of our cycle time. Mm -hmm. And so, so it, it, it kind of, um, if we have a stable cycle time, then we can more reliably make a forecast that it, it, it will more likely be accurate. Sure. The nature of a lot of our work is just random. Yeah. And you can see that if you, if you compare like cycle times with how you estimated them, mm -hmm. you'll see that, oh, we gave this one a, we gave this one a four, mm -hmm. but really it still took two days. Like no matter what we do on the average, like 85% of the time, it's <laughs> like three days or less yeah. or whatever, whatever the number is. So, so yeah, so if we can get that, so if we can get our cycle time to be stable, then we can rely on our forecasts more. And I'm, I'm kind of talking about this without any visuals, so it's, it's kind of hard to, to anchor that. But, uh, yeah. but I think, you know, and again, like the, the message is 
you don't have to be the fastest and have the lowest cycle time. We just want to be predictable. We mm -hmm. just want to be able to, like if our customers are expecting something on this date range, we want to deliver on that date range mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, let's get it next Friday, like a, a specific deterministic date. We can have converse. If we get our stable cycle time and we like use these tools, we can have better conversations about risk with our customers as well. Like, all right, well, based on how we track our workflow, if you want this by July 12th, uh, we only have like 50% certainty that we can get you this number of items between July 12th and July 15th. This, mm -hmm. We only have like, we have like a 50% chance. And it's kind of risky for us, but you know, we have an 85% chance that we can get you these like August 7th to August 12th, like somewhere in that range. So we have different types of conversations. Yeah. I mean, this is uh, where we are coming up on time in a little bit and it's uh, maybe, maybe we'll have to revisit this because this is uh, exploding into a whole host of questions for me, but uh, <laughs> uh, regarding, regarding estimates, but uh, maybe I'll try to hone in on a couple um, and then maybe have Chris have one. So one is, uh, um, I, I like the idea of having a metric that only the team sees that doesn't get abused. I have rarely, I have seen this fail more often than not, because as soon as I've been in some organizations where as soon as management knows about a metric, they want it and they want it reported on and they measure you by it. And then they'll start measuring not only the team, but they'll start measuring people. Like how do you, how do you prevent it from getting misused? I guess I've, I know of one case where it hasn't, but I've seen many, many cases where, it gets misused really quickly. How have you helped? Yeah, that? yeah, that's a really good question. So like this particular initiative, and by the way, on my website, I have links to some videos that my colleague Tim and I, where we talk about this stuff in depth and we give like visuals and everything. Um, basically the idea is uh, we don't force people, right? This is not some kind of top-down initiative where everyone must do this mm -hmm. and like report on it. We've done it on more of kind of like a poll system where uh, kind of a grassroots thing that took off, and we tell the story in these videos that we can, I can share with you later, but the basic idea is we looked for squads or teams in our context that wanted a better strategy for forecasting when their work was gonna be done. And then you know, we, we brought Dan Vacanti in, he did some two-day trainings, and we, we had three complete squads use some of these tools, but the three squads that were invited to this training were ones that wanted to be there because whatever methods they were using were not effective and reliable for estimating when their work was going to be done. Like they wanted a better way. And, uh, and so then words started to spread. I think we've trained more than, uh, 25, more than 25 teams now that want the training. And we, so we had Dan come in twice. We developed materials, upped our knowledge, Tim and I on this developed a coalition of people that want to teach this stuff it's with engineering managers primarily. And then now we offer a two hour session for any squad who wants to get better at forecasting. We use this work in progress game, which is a free online tool, which gives a visceral train. It gives you a visceral idea of what it's like. If you reduce your work in progress, you are going to have greater throughput on the work that you do. So we do two hours, we, we get the squad's data in the tooling, they want to see, well, what is, what is our workflow like typically? We have the plugin, so we use that. And, uh, you know, so, so this is stuff that people want, and we check in with them. We, ought, we have a more advanced course that we can offer them as well. And it's really, it's really about uh, these, if you want to benchmark where your team is at and then iterate on it, Again, you can have a retrospective. Look at your flow. Let's try an experiment to get our cycle time stable. Oh, okay, let's lean more heavily into working on aging tickets. Maybe we make that agreement. And then at our next retrospective, we take a look. How's our cycle time? Is it more stable? Yes or no? So these, it's really like, sometimes the word metrics can get kind of loaded, but these I really view as techniques for the squads to kind of really kind of own their forecasting and get and have a better way to do it. Somebody asks us, teach us estimation, we want a better way to forecast our work. The default that we teach are the, the techniques from Dan Vacanti. We don't go, if, if somebody, if, if a team already estimates and does the story points and whatever, 
it's a separate issue. They can keep doing that. We teach them these other cycle time Kanban inspired techniques and more than often they abandon the other stuff because it's not as useful. So, but we respect that, you know, if, 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 if a team has a strategy and it's working great for them and they're nailing their, they're matching the expectations with their clients, they're delivering that value at a cadence that everybody loves. Cool. All right, great. Maybe you'll discover something that informs our default training method that makes it better. Like we want to know, but for now, the, the default that we train is actionable agile. They don't pay me, by the way. I, I, I can get off kind of salesy, but I'm just saying that I'm a practitioner. This is what we do and what we found uh, to be very beneficial for those that want it. Um, and word catches on. I mean, if, if you want to spread an in innovation in a social system, uh, word of mouth, person to person, is they've shown in, in the book, Diffusion of Innovations, Everett Rogers, in agriculture, it happens the same way. Person-to-person -person communication is a way to spread the innovation. Now we had to get executive buy-in on, on doing this stuff. And we did two studies to prove that these methods work. Like we had to jump through hoops to get this like official. Um, but now, you know, it's just, you know, we're there to help. People want the help. So uh, what, um... What sort of uh, side effects, I guess, do you, like kind of anecdotally, what sort of side effects do you see when a team moves from traditional uh, estimation to Monte Carlo simulations? Um, what, what kind of, what, what do you see as the outcomes of, of doing that transition? Like uh, maybe uh, they spend less time doing kind of busy work pointing mm -hmm. and the conversations might be more around like, acceptance criteria like if they write stories like what does it mean to get the story done like some kind of acceptance criteria in the story mm -hmm. or just kind of focus elsewhere uh i we have um like some we'll do like we'll do lunch and learns where engineering engineers will share like some of the impacts of this that's one one of the ways we get the word out yeah um yeah the we did learn that like you have to train the whole team together so that they're that they want to yeah. do it um if they don't that's fine um but then maybe they need it like okay well you still have to tell people when is it going to be done so if your strategy is not effective you know if, is, you might have uh, other problems um but th this definitely saves people time i think yeah. it's it's lowered stress on people as well we had an engineering cool. manager they, they had to meet with an enterprise customer like every few weeks mm -hmm. using these techniques help to reduce his stress. Mm -hmm. And they use them in parallel with their older estimation techniques and just wound up abandoning those because if you have the discipline to look at aging tickets, if you have the discipline to work on less to get more throughput, these tools can be really effective for you. If you don't have that discipline and your cycle time is all crazy and, and random, because the yeah. work is random, as Dan says, then yeah. you won't have uh, such success. This is not this is not like some magic uh, remedy for all of our estimation woes. Yeah, it's it's a strategy that if we're all in on it and we agree to use it and and understand the discipline we need to have, mm -hmm. then it could really make our lives easier. And I think Dan. Like Dan's book, When Will It Be Done, for example, and Actionable Agile Metrics is such a great contribution to our industry yeah. that I'm really glad to, and he's funny too, which is like a bonus. Like oh, he, yeah. maybe he can come on your show. <laughs> like he, he's just, uh, he's got a lot of great stories. Um, so it, it's very well received when, when we brought him in. So it, it sounds to me a lot like, um, you know, getting more of the people that are, you know, more of the software developers away from maybe calling out story points and, and switching over to more of like a measure, measurement and probability based approach to drive towards more Kanban, real, maybe realistic Kanban, I guess like uh, limited width and, and things along those lines. Is that an accurate description? Yeah, I, I think for the most part and, and, um, like we recommend the Kanban guide for scrum teams, which is a short PDF by one of the scrum organizations that Dan co-wrote. Mm -hmm. And it goes over some key flow metrics that can be used 
with teams that practice um, what they would call scrum and for teams that practice something else. This level of um, probabilistic forecasting and flow metrics kind of is above all of those frameworks, but they took their they took their root in the early days of Kanban. But I think this is the first time, at least in my career, where we've seen some tooling to go along with it that makes this stuff possible. Because mm-hmm. maybe not everybody is going to do the number crunching of a manual Monte Carlo. I don't know how to do the math, but I know how to <laughs> use the charts in actual yeah. Agile. It makes it just accessible. Yeah. Now we, I, you know, I, I know actionable Agile works with a lot of different um, sets of tools, and they have it at their website. But you know, we're all we're using Jira, and it helps us make Jira more useful. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So we use the plugin for Jira. Right. We're in there anyway, so let's have a different window into it where we can see and improve our workflow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of automating things that you'd otherwise be doing manually. So this, this yeah. sounds kind of right in that space. So. I think it helps it scale too, because I mean, if you have 50 teams, like doing it all manually is just, yeah. you, you've got other things to do um, yeah. to build, so. Okay. Well, um, so uh, I think we sh- we should ask if there's anything that you'd like to plug or or uh, talk about before we end the show. Uh, we're kind of coming up on time here, and so yeah, I'll, I'll do one for you. I, I like this book a lot. So <laughs> the dynamic reteaming, um, and and you know, I we have our story in there as well as many other great stories. So um, yeah, yeah, I there's there's some great stories in here. Uh, especially about the spirit of retrospectives yeah. uh, that, that I would recommend. And thanks, Chris, for your contribution. This is the second edition, so there's a lot of practical ideas, and it's more refined than the first edition. So if the, re- if the reteaming idea is interesting, you might, yeah. might want to check this out. You can visit me at HeidiHealthAnd.com, get a hold of me there or on LinkedIn, if any of this was interesting. And yeah. Um, yeah, I really, you know, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. All right. Well, thank you very much, Heidi, for being with us. And Definitely. Uh, to all of our viewers, thank you for listening or watching. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you think that this is important information for somebody that you know, please share it with that person. Uh, because I think that a lot of these ideas, uh, like Heidi said in, earlier, it's a diffusion of innovation. And so... Uh, If you think somebody needs this information quickly, then just send them the link. So otherwise, we will talk to you all later. Thanks for being with us here on the show. Bye, everybody.